Dead America, Tales of the First Month, The Action Star, Part 3. The trio stood inside the dimly lit clothing store, their hearts pounding in sync with the relentless thuds from the mob of flesh-eating corpses outside. The grotesque figures pressed against the glass door front, clawing and gnashing at the door and windows, driven by an intense hunger. Let's get away from the window. No point in tempting them further, urged Gideon, his voice firm with urgency. Warren and Casey nodded at his wise suggestion, and the trio quickly retreated towards the back of the store, seeking refuge from the prying eyes of the undead. Well, at least we made it a few blocks, Warren commented, attempting to find some consolation in their dire situation. However, Casey promptly silenced him with a sharp smack on the arm, reminding him of the gravity of their predicament. So what do we do? Casey asked, her voice tinged with concern and uncertainty. Gideon took a moment to consider their options, trying to keep a level head amidst the chaos surrounding them. I'm open to suggestions, he replied, hoping one of them would come up with a viable plan. How far are we from the storage facility? Casey questioned, her mind already working on a potential escape route. At least half a mile, maybe a little more, Gideon replied. His expression clouded with concern. Warren added, It would be good to know if we have a clear path to it. Yeah, but for that, we'd need to be up. Casey trailed off, their gazes instinctively turning upwards, scanning the ceiling in search of an escape route. Gideon was the first to spot the hatch in the corner of the ceiling, about 15 feet above them. Got it, Gideon declared, his eyes fixed on the hatch, a glimmer of hope in the darkness. How do we even get up there? Climbing on shoulders won't cut it, Casey mused, considering their limited options. There were a bunch of boxes in the storeroom, Warren suggested, his eyes darting back and forth between the others and the glass front, worried about the impending danger. At that moment, the front glass cracked slightly, a chilling reminder of the imminent threat outside. Let's do it quick then, Casey urged, not wanting to waste any more time. The three of them rushed to the back storeroom, their hearts pounding in sync with the approaching danger, and quickly located the shipping boxes. The boxes were heavy, loaded down with clothing and other items. Gideon picked up one, straining as he carried it into the main room. Casey and Warren opted for a team approach, each grabbing another box. Over the next few minutes, they brought out every box they could find, creating a makeshift staircase leading towards the elusive hatch. Despite their collective effort, they still fell a few feet short of reaching the hatch. Well, it was a good idea at least, Warren admitted, sounding defeated. Gideon refused to give up hope, reassuring them. We're not out of it yet. Determined to find a solution, Gideon climbed up the makeshift tower, reaching the top where the hatch remained just out of his reach. He requested his sword from Casey, who quickly wrapped a shirt around the blade before passing it up to him. Using the sword as an extension of himself, Gideon pushed the tip against the hatch, silently hoping it would yield. He whispered to himself, Please be unlocked. Summoning all his strength, he pushed with all his might, and the hatch opened, falling onto the roof with a loud thud. Gideon breathed a sigh of relief as he looked back down to Casey and Warren. Stay here. I'll be right back. He crouched down, securing the sword into the top box to anchor it in place for him. With a deep breath, he launched himself into the air, reaching out for the ledge of the hatch. Surprisingly, his fingers found purchase, and he managed to pull himself up. He exhaled, grateful for his success, and called down to his companions. If those things get inside, get up here and start yelling. I'll pull you up. Casey and Warren gave him a thumbs up as he vanished onto the roof. Gideon quickly made his way to the front edge of the building, peering down at the assembled mass of undead below. Easily over a hundred creatures filled the street in front of the store, with more converging from both directions. Assessing the situation, Gideon noticed the narrow gaps between the buildings on this block, only about six feet wide. A plan formed in his mind, a potential route for escape. Summoning his courage, he took a running start leaping across the first gap and landing with a slight stumble. 
Steadying himself, he continued with a series of jumps, propelling himself from building to building, inching his way to the far end of the block. Approaching the side, Gideon maintained a low profile, cautious not to attract the attention of the creatures below. He peered over the edge, relieved to see only a small number of corpses below. The sight filled him with hope that the narrow gaps might offer them a way to evade the deadly mob and find safety. Gideon surveyed the perilous situation from the back of the building, his mind racing for a safe way down. His eyes darted around, desperately seeking a fire escape or any means of descent, but the building's exterior offered no such aid. A daunting 15-foot drop separated them from the ground below, and jumping seemed out of the question. A glimmer of hope flickered as Gideon's gaze drifted down the narrow alleyway, revealing a dumpster about 10 yards away, partially filled with cardboard boxes and assorted trash. It appeared like a potential makeshift cushion for their fall. Despite its modest utility, the dumpster offered them some respite. And from what Gideon could discern, there wasn't anything overly dangerous in it. Gideon's voice carried a hint of determination as he assessed their options. Fifteen feet is a hell of a drop, but I don't think we're going to have much of a choice. Their escape plan hinged on this desperate maneuver, but with no other viable alternatives, it seemed inevitable. The zombies in the alleyway were fortunately a distance away, allowing the trio some time to execute their plan before danger closed in. Gonna have to do, Gideon decided, stealing himself for the dangerous leap. Swiftly, he turned and dashed back to the clothing store's entrance. Before leaping down, he peered inside, ensuring the glass wouldn't give way under his weight. Once satisfied, he descended the precarious cardboard stairs, taking each step with caution and agility. Casey's voice quivered with worry. How's it look? The buildings are close enough together that we can make a run for it to the end of the block. And then what? Warren questioned, seeking reassurance. We get down to the street and keep going. We've drawn quite the crowd down here. So it's really opened it up out there, Gideon explained, his mind already churning with contingency plans. Casey, still hoping for a less risky route, probed further. So there's a ladder on the side of the building or something. Gideon hesitated for a moment before responding. The uncertainty in Gideon's tone didn't escape Casey and Warren, and their expressions mirrored the anxiety they felt. Concerned, Warren pressed for clarification. You mind elaborating a bit? Reluctantly, Gideon revealed, Well, there's a dumpster. Oh, shit, Casey whispered under her breath. Let's hear him out, Warren chimed in, trying to find a glimmer of hope in Gideon's plan. It's mostly filled with cardboard boxes and other trash. I've done stunt falls from much higher into less, Gideon assured, his voice trying to alleviate their worries. However, Casey couldn't help but express doubt reminding Gideon that they were not action stars and teasingly mentioning Warren's previous injury. Gideon continued to persuade them. See, it'll work just fine. And besides, it's not going to be that bad of a fall. It's only 15 feet, and I'll lower you down off the roof. You can do it, I promise. As they deliberated, the constant cracking of the storefront glass heightened their sense of urgency. They knew they had to act quickly or their escape route might be compromised. Unless you have a better idea, I think this is what we're going to have to go with, Warren reasoned, accepting the grim reality. Reluctantly, Casey sighed. Yeah, you're right. Their disappointment was palpable, knowing that they couldn't do anything about the relentless mob of zombies pursuing them. It's a shame that we can't do anything about that mob. Going to suck if we get up the street and make a noise only to have them keep following us around town. Casey lamented. In a sudden turn of humor, Warren adopted a playful and confident tone, referencing a scene from one of Gideon's movies that might offer some inspiration. Well, Casey, if you had watched the assault on Baymont Street, then you'd know what to do. A bit amused, Warren turned to Gideon, acknowledging one of my personal favorites of yours, I might add. Yeah, yeah, I know. I was slacking. But what happened? Casey asked with genuine curiosity. With a nostalgic smile, Gideon began to recount the scene. The trap scene. The trap scene, Warren echoed, 
nodding his head in agreement. Intrigued, Casey probed. Okay, I'll bite. What's the trap scene? Despite the excitement in Warren's voice, Casey acknowledged a critical flaw in their plan. One problem with your plan, though. We don't have a Molotov. Unfazed, Warren cleverly produced a half-drunk bottle of cheap vodka from one of the food bags, suggesting pretty sure this will do the trick. Casey's surprise was evident. I use that stuff to clean the laser on my cutter. Why would you bring that? Warren flashed a playful smile. I figured we'd either need something to celebrate with, something to drown our sorrows, or something to burn. Gideon praised Warren's resourcefulness. Good job, Warren. Grab a shirt over there and get it ready. Casey, let's get you up to the roof. Their determination ignited. The trio moved with purpose, quickly gathering their gear and making their way up to the roof. Casey was the first to ascend, receiving a boost from Gideon. Warren followed, expertly climbing the boxes with urgency. Their hearts pounded in sync with the adrenaline coursing through their veins. Just then, the dreaded sound they had feared echoed through the empty buildings, the shattering of the storefront glass. A city block away, the noise seemed to reverberate with a foreboding echo, urging them to complete their daring escape before it was too late. Gideon exuded calm assurance as he eased his companion's anxiety. Calm down. We're good. Let's get you up there. Warren nodded in agreement, accepting Gideon's supportive boost while Casey reached down from the rooftop, lending her hand to assist. Once Warren joined them on the roof, Gideon handed up his sword, preparing for his own ascension. Before leaping, he cast a wary glance toward the front of the store, witnessing a horde of creatures flooding in through the gaping hole. A good star knows when to make his exit, Gideon quipped, underlining the significance of their timely escape. He propelled himself upward, and his companions rallied to help him onto the roof. Peering through the opening, they observed the chaotic scene below. Warren prepared the Molotov cocktail, extracting a lighter from his pocket and handing the bottle to Gideon. Let's do it, Gideon proclaimed, his resolve unwavering. Before Warren ignited the Molotov, he hesitated, looking somewhat sheepish. Would you, would you mind saying the line? He asked, his voice tinged with timidness. Gideon chuckled warmly, nodding appreciatively at his newfound friend. Gripping the Molotov firmly, Gideon shook it slightly before Warren ignited the fuse. Assuming a kneeling position, he looked through the hatch into the store, projecting an extraordinarily loud and commanding voice. All right, you motherfuckers. You've shot me, stabbed me, and killed everyone I love. But I'm still standing. There's no forgiveness from me or God. But I will give you the chance to be cleansed. With hellfire. With practiced expertise. Gideon hurled the Molotov into the store, watching it shatter just a few steps away from some of the approaching zombies. Flames rapidly engulfed the creatures and the surrounding clothing racks transforming the store into a blazing inferno. Gideon rose to his feet, turning back to Warren, who was beaming with elation, and Casey, who wore a slightly bewildered expression. You good, Casey? Gideon inquired, checking on her well-being. Yeah, just wondering why those guys didn't just shoot you mid-monologue, Casey asked with an amused grin. Gideon and Warren shared a moment of thoughtful contemplation, attempting to devise an appropriate response to Casey's astute observation. Eventually, Gideon replied, Well, it was the 80s, and bad guys back in those days had manners. Warren eagerly chimed in, adding humor to the conversation. Yeah, they'd let the good guy monologue as long as he'd like. You know, for effect. Casey chuckled, thoroughly entertained by their banter, before she strode purposefully toward the next building. Gideon and Warren exchanged a shrug, silently acknowledging the puzzling nature of their answer. That makes sense, right? Gideon sought validation from Warren, their friendship solidifying. Totally, Warren confirmed, his smile a testament to their shared understanding. Gideon replied, projecting confidence despite the perilous circumstances. Or something. Warren half-joked, Hey, that was different. I was trying to stretch, not fall. Give me a break, Warren. 
Remember when you pulled your hamstring trying to get out of bed the other morning, Casey said. Warren launches into an impassioned speech. Gideon's character, Reuben, is fighting with this gang that has chased him all around Baymont Street. Finally, he's had enough, so he lures them into this big building filled with flammable material, climbs up to the roof, and drops a big Molotov cocktail down onto them. Whole place goes up in a massive blaze and takes his enemies down. It would be my pleasure. The trio navigated across the rooftops with a blend of agility and caution, gracefully leaping over the small gaps between buildings. As they approached the final rooftop, they looked back to witness a colossal plume of smoke billowing from the store they had set ablaze. Gideon, Warren, and Casey peered over the ledge toward the dumpster below, relieved to find that the few zombies who'd been within 20 yards had dispersed in different directions. Okay, Warren, your first buddy. Lay down on the ledge here, grab on as hard as you can, and swing your legs over the side. I'll get a good hold of you and lower you down another foot or so. When I let go, act like you're in a recliner. Legs out, back up, so you land on your rear end. Can you do that for me? Gideon provided Warren with clear instructions, preparing him for the daring descent. Warren experienced a mix of fear and determination, unwilling to show any sign of cowardice in front of his action movie hero. He steeled himself, nodding firmly. I got this. Gideon positioned himself on the edge, with Casey holding onto his side. He then grasped Warren's arm firmly, ready to lower him down. Let go, I got you, Gideon reassured Warren. Trusting in Gideon's expertise, Warren released his grip, allowing Gideon to lower him as far as possible before gently releasing him. Here we go, Gideon announced, freeing Warren for the descent. Following Gideon's instructions, Warren adopted a seated position, falling toward the dumpster with a sense of relief as he landed safely among the boxes. Quickly scrambling to climb out of the dumpster, Warren struggled to find his footing for a moment before finally pulling himself out. With adrenaline still coursing through his veins, he wasted no time in scanning the area for any potential threats. The zombies at either side of the alleyway heard Warren's fall and started shambling in his direction. Though they were still a significant distance away, he looked up at Gideon and signaled for him to drop his bat, which landed with a slight thud in the dumpster. Without wasting a moment, Warren quickly dove halfway back in, shoving boxes aside to retrieve his weapon before adopting an attack position to confront the approaching undead. Amid the looming threat, Casey landed into the dumpster. Warren instinctively turned to help her, but she waved him off with a reassuring gesture. I'm good. Go bust some heads. He nodded in response and rushed forward toward a couple of zombies within ten yards of them. Swinging the bat with all his strength, he cracked the skull of one creature, dropping it to the ground. The other zombie lunged at him, but Warren skillfully sidestepped out of harm's way, causing the clumsy creature to stumble away. Seizing the opportunity, he swung the bat again, striking the zombie in the back of the head, causing it to collapse. With precision, he delivered a forceful kill shot to finish the job. Warren then turned his attention back to Casey, observing Gideon expertly dispatching the zombies on the other side. Closing the distance, Warren joined them just as the last zombie fell to the ground, its head severely damaged. We're good on this side, Warren reported. And the ninja dominator has cleaned up this side, Casey added with a touch of humor. Gideon turned toward them, placing a finger to his lips, urging them to speak quietly. He then motioned for them to follow him as they worked their way up the alley and eventually reached the street. Peering around the corner, Gideon observed several zombies near the intersection, but they were all shuffling off toward the burning store. Gideon waved them across, and the trio sprinted toward the next alley where they encountered a handful of wandering undead. Gideon effortlessly cut them down, clearing the way ahead. After a few tense minutes of navigating the streets, they reached the block where the storage facility stood. Gideon directed his gaze toward the gated entrance, where a few zombies loitered outside taking advantage of the partially open gate. The front gate was a chain-link fence on a manual pulley system, providing enough space for zombies to enter. Gideon tried to assess the situation inside the facility, 
but his vantage point wasn't ideal. Based on the half dozen or so zombies in the parking lot, he assumed there were several more inside. Okay, this isn't going to be as easy as we thought, Gideon admitted, addressing the team. What's up? Casey inquired. The front gate's open, so there's probably some inside, Gideon replied. So now what? Warren asked. We press on. We're going to run right by the ones in the parking lot and shut the front gate. Once we do that, I want you two getting inside the small office that's just off from the entrance. Once you're secure, I'll clear the facility. Gideon outlined his plan. We can help, Casey insisted. I know, but I know this place well. It won't take me long to secure it, and I can do it quicker on my own, Gideon assured them. Casey gave him a concerned look, to which he responded with a confident smile. Just trust me. Okay, we'll do as you ask. We're right behind you when you're ready, Casey agreed, putting her faith in Gideon's expertise. Gideon nodded, tightening his grip on his sword. It was a good 50 yards from their current position to the front gate, and he couldn't see what lay beyond. He hoped there wouldn't be too many zombies waiting in their blind spot. Motioning for Casey and Warren to follow, Gideon led the way out into the open. They began jogging at first, but as they reached the edge of the parking lot, Gideon picked up speed, sprinting as hard as he could toward the opening in the fencing. The heavy footsteps alerted the nearby zombies, and they started converging on the trio. However, Gideon's momentum was too great, and he crashed through them like an adult joining an elementary school game of Red Rover. The ghouls went flying off to the sides as he reached the gate and swiftly entered, with Casey and Warren following closely behind. Once inside, Gideon grabbed the gate and started pulling it closed, slamming it shut. Warren rushed over and secured it with a padlock, but left it unlatched. The three of them stepped back, watching as the half-dozen zombies reached the gate, shaking it in impotent rage at not being able to get inside. Get into the office. Make sure it's clear and then lock yourselves in. I won't be long, Gideon instructed, addressing Casey and Warren. Be careful, Casey said with concern. Where's the fun in that? Gideon replied with a wink, preparing for the impending battle. As Casey and Warren retreated into the office, Gideon set his sights on the task at hand. Moving swiftly, just under a runner's pace, he made his way to the first intersection of the complex spotting a handful of zombies in both directions. Gideon couldn't help but chuckle at the sight of the zombies scattered around like broken toys on a playroom floor. Figures you guys couldn't pick a direction. Going to get my steps in today, he quipped to himself, relishing the thrill of battle. With a clear sense of purpose, he set off to his left, navigating through the moderately sized storage complex that formed essentially one big square. His movements were agile and precise, like a seasoned dancer, choreographing a deadly routine. Along the way, three zombies stood in his path, groaning and reaching out for him with outstretched arms. But they were no match for Gideon's well-honed skills. With a few swift swings of his sword, he severed their connection to the world of the living, reducing them to lifeless pieces at his feet. As he made the turn up toward his storage unit, he was met with the daunting sight of nearly a dozen zombies tightly packed together. Well, I'm not running through that, Gideon remarked calmly, assessing the situation with the cool composure of a veteran fighter. Instead, he reached for a handful of ninja stars, casually strolling toward the approaching horde, as though he were starring in an old-style western movie from the 50s, playing the role of the dashing gunslinger. Stopping about 15 yards from the front edge of the mob, Gideon brandished the projectiles theatrically as if performing for an imaginary camera, capturing his every move. Steadying himself, he threw the first ninja star, and it found its mark with deadly precision in the eye socket of a zombie in the middle. The impact caused a chain reaction of stumbling among the undead, providing an opening for Gideon to exploit. Swiftly, he launched more stars each finding their targets with deadly accuracy, creating a gaping hole in the middle of the pack. Undeterred, Gideon rushed towards the trio on his left, his movements a symphony of power and grace. As he reached the first zombie, he leaped into the air with an athletic flourish, 
delivering a forceful kick to the leader's chest. The zombie tumbled backward, taking down its two companions in a macabre domino effect, making the cleanup quite easy for the ninja dominator. With the immediate threat neutralized, Gideon turned to face the other three zombies, who had spread out a bit. His battle instincts were honed to perfection as he engaged them one by one. With each precise swing of his sword and deftly thrown star, he dispatched the ghouls with ruthless efficiency. Having cleared the immediate area, Gideon continued his quest to reach his storage unit. Pressing on, he reached the back aisle of the compound, and to his satisfaction, it appeared to be completely empty, giving him hope that he had eliminated the majority of the undead inside. He walked along the wall of storage units, scanning the numbers until he finally found the one he was seeking. Number 353. There was a padlock on it, secured with a five-digit code. Without hesitation, he entered the code 41687, representing the release date of his first movie. While it wasn't a major role, it marked the beginning of his career, a fond memory from a different lifetime. With the lock disengaged, Gideon pulled open the door, revealing a massive 4x4 truck connected to a boat trailer. He patted the hood of the vehicle appreciatively before getting inside through the driver's side. As he pulled down the sunshade, the keys dropped into his lap with a soft jingle, and he couldn't help but feel a surge of hope. This truck had been his trusted companion in the past, and now it had the potential to be his savior. Okay, moment of truth, Gideon murmured, the weight of the world resting on his shoulders. He inserted the key into the ignition, holding his breath for a moment before turning it. His heart pounded with anticipation as he hoped beyond hope that the battery was still functional. The truck sputtered for a few moments, causing Gideon's heart to sink momentarily. However, before his spirits could plummet, the engine roared to life, responding to the faith he had placed in it. A smile spread across his face as he gave the vehicle a little gas, coaxing it into running smoothly, purring like a cozy kitten. He lovingly stroked the dashboard, a silent acknowledgement of the truck's loyalty. That's my girl, he said affectionately, feeling a sense of gratitude for the trusty machine that had come through for him once again. After a few more moments of letting the engine idle, he shut it off and got out of the truck. As he emerged from the storage locker, he looked around with determination, scanning the surrounding area with the eyes of a seasoned survivor. Okay, home stretch he declared, ready to face whatever lay ahead with resolve. This is the end of the Action Star Part 3. Tune in next time for the thrilling conclusion with Gideon, the Ninja Dominator.